All right, in section 6.3, we review a lot of stuff that should have been seen in pre-calc, but here it is again nonetheless. We have sigma notation for representing sums of quantities. So if you're trying to add up a bunch of stuff instead of writing something plus something plus something plus something, especially if there is a pattern to it, if you can generate it using some sort of formula, uh, if you're trying to add up these numbers, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, all the way up to a sub n, you can condense this into sigma notation. So this is the letter sigma from the Greek alphabet. i is called the index, or it's the counter. Basically, this is sort of, uh, you know how when you're flying, someone goes up and down the aisle and they count the number of people by clicking on the thing to make sure everyone's on the flight uh, and there's no more people or no fewer people. Uh, it's the same idea here, that i is just the counter, and it starts at some number. This is called the lower bound. It doesn't have to be 1. It could be 5 or 17. Uh, in the canonical definition, it starts at 1, but there's no requirement that a summation start at 1. A summation can start wherever you want it to. Uh, one of the things you have to remember is that you always count by integers. So you're always counting by 1, 2, 3, so, and so on and so forth. No, no decimals or fractions come in here n is the upper bound. That's where you stop counting. So if the capacity of a plane is 300 passengers, your counter should not go past 300. Once you hit 300, you should stop. And if you still have people on board that you haven't counted, then you know that you've let on more people on board than you should have. So uh, perhaps examples of how this notation is used if you have summation of i, from i equals 1 to i equals 6, this just means take i equals 1 and plug it in here. So if I plug in 1, I get just 1 by itself. Plus, now have I reached this number? No. Then add the next one in. So after i equals 1 comes i equals 2. Well, that's just 2, so I'm going to add 2 to it. Plus 3, plus 4, plus 5, plus 6. And then the moment you get to this number, the upper bound, you stop. So if you add up the first six integers, you're going to get 21 or first six natural numbers, rather, you're going to get 21. Uh, another example, if we have a counter from, or an index from j equals 3, which is the lower bound, to j equals 12, which is the upper bound, and the formula, excuse me, the formula that generates our, our summation is uh, j squared. That means whatever this number is, you have to square it before you can put it on the other side. This is the formula that's telling us what to do with the index value. So first it's 3, so we start with 3 squared. Then you say, hey, is 3 less than 12? Yes, so keep going. So what's after 3? 4. Then you do 4 squared. So plus 4 squared, 5 squared, plus 6 squared, plus 7 squared, 8, 9, 10, 11. And then plus 12 squared is the last one because that's the upper bound. You hit the roof, you can't go further. And then if you add up all these things, I use my machine and I got 645. So this is just notation on how... Uh, expressions are written now. One thing that you should have practiced in pre-calc is expanding this notation out to look like this, but then also equally important is being able to go backwards. So how is it that you can take 1 plus 2 plus 3 blah 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 up until 6 and condense it into sigma notation to make it look like that? Those are both equally uh, important skills. In fact, I would argue for upper division math, being able to go from here to come up with a closed form like this is, is probably far more important. It, it takes a, a fair bit of creativity to be able to come up with that. Going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, you're just plugging in numbers. So th there's not much in the way of, of creativity and, and ingenuity that's needed there, but being given a sequence of numbers that are being added together or subtracted for that matter, to go back to the formula, that, that's, that requires some clever stuff. Uh, more on that later when we get to it. And you'll see this a significantly more amount in Calc 2 or in Calc BC if you take that next. Uh, there's an entire chapter, in fact, devoted to just sequences and series. So th this really is uh, very, very, very for foundational, important stuff. Now, there's some properties of summation. Again, hopefully these are coming back from uh, pre-calc. It, there's a scalar multiple rule or a scalar multiple property. It simply means that if there's a constant being multiplied by some formula, so here, if we had 5j squared, I could take the 5 and I could push it out of the summation, just like we've done with limits and, 
and derivatives. The constant multiple rule just said, hey, take the constant, push it outside, do the thing you need to with the expression, and then multiply the constant back in. The same thing still applies here. There's a sum and a difference property. Uh, if you're adding two formulas together, you can find the sum of just the first formula by itself and find the sum of the second formula by itself and then add those two as the results. And then the same thing with differences as well. Now, something that I want you to be careful of that this only, that the sum and difference property only work if n is finite. Uh, this is not mentioned in the textbook or perhaps in the notes, but it, it's a very, very important distinction to remember that if you have a finite sum, meaning n is maybe even a trillion, it's still going to be a finite number. These two properties, the sum and the difference properties, only work if n is finite. So if I change this to infinity, this property may or may not work. If I change this to infinity, this property may or may not work. In, in fact, it almost always breaks down in spectacular fashion. So you want to be careful uh, that this is only being used when we have a finite number. Now here are some known formulas that you should memorize. If you have a constant, notice that this does not say c sub i or c times i. This is just c by itself. So this is some constant. You're adding up the constant n number of times. So if I were to write this out, maybe as an example, if I have the summation of the number 2 from i equals 1 to i equals 4, this just means when i equals 1, add 2. When i equals 2, add 2. When i equals 3, add 2. When i equals 4, add 2. When i equals 5, well, 5 is greater than my upper bound, so I have to stop. Now, isn't this the same as 2 times 4? So that's why the formula is saying c times n. So if you add up a constant n times, that's really just going to give you c times n as the answer. Uh, next, we have the summation of the first n integers, the positive integers. This is going to be n times n plus 1 over 2. Uh, the, all of these need to be committed to memory because you're going to have to use them in, in solving problems. These are not given on the AP exam, so please make sure that uh, when we see the next couple of problems uh, as examples that you are making note of these and you're writing them down every single time. Don't just keep copying it over. You're not going to memorize them or commit them to memorize, uh, memory otherwise. Uh, these can be proved using induction, but that's beyond the scope of this course. Uh, you don't have to know how or why these formulas are true. If you ever take a course called discrete math, you'll, you'll learn it there and you'll prove it there, in fact. But for us, if you just add up the first n numbers, the sum is going to be given by n times n plus 1 over 2. The summation of the first squares is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. And then the sum of the first n cubes is n squared times n plus 1, the quantity squared, over 4. Please make sure these four formulas are memorized and committed to memory. How am I doing on time? Eight and a half minutes. Uh, I'm going to stop the video here, and then eh, we can do this example. So let's say we're asked to find the summation. Because my upper limit is finite, I can really break this down into three separate sums using the sum and difference rule. So I can say, hey, this is the sum of i squared minus the summation from i equals 1 to 10 of i plus the summation from i equals 1 to 10 of the number 4. Now you'll notice i squared, I can use this formula, number 3. For just i, I can use this formula, number 2. And then for just the number 4, which is a constant, I can use the first formula. So this will really be, for the i squared, you're looking at the upper limit and saying uh, n times n plus 1 times n 2n plus 1 over 6 minus the summation from 1 to 10 for i is going to be uh, n times n plus 1 over 2, plus the summation from 4 to 10 will be 4n, and this expression is being evaluated for n equals 10. So I always write this down. I write down the formulas, and then I figure out what my n value is going to be. 
Now at this stage, you can plug in the n equals 10. So 10 times 11 times 21 over 6 minus 10 times 11 over 2 plus 4 times 10 is 40. And if you clean this up, 2 goes into the 10 5 times, uh, 2 goes into 6 3 times, into 5, 3 goes into 7. Uh, I'm going to need a machine for this. 5 times 11 times 7 minus 55 plus 40. In fact, I'm going to cheat. This is 370. Just in the nick of time. All right, we'll see you guys in the next video.